These are often, to many of us, emancipatory projects, but we must never forget the degree to which they are traveling North Atlantic Western modules of this European world. And they bear also their traces of this vernacular origin. They've become, of course, a genuine vernacular tradition in some places. You could argue that elections are at least as deeply embedded in India after 50 years of competitive elections as they are in the United States uh, or England or Canada. Um, but they are, these NGOs are the bearers of a North Atlantic vernacular project, even though they're opposed in many respects to the neoliberal economic standardization of which I spoke earlier. And I just want to close, uh, I have a, I have a self-critique of this talk, but I'm going to save that for what you can extract out of me later. Um, but I just wanted to end with a query, which is, do these NGO projects into which I imagine successful Trent graduates hurl themselves enthusiastically. Do these NGO projects bear a relationship to a world neoliberal economic order that is analogous to the relationship between 19th century Christian missionaries and colonial authorities? Are they both Western civilizational projects, even though they're in part at odds with one another? And isn't it amazing that uh, compared to the world a century ago, uh, it is, it's, isn't it amazing the degree to which institutional orders uh, converge? And this convergence is not a result of some world Hegelian spirit moving everything in the same direction. It's a result of asymmetries of power and control and finance uh, that work even at the level of NGOs in addition to the level of international organizations and nation states. Thank you. Don't follow the, the De Soto uh, program for the reform of the whole world very closely. Uh, and as I understand uh, De Soto's idea, both with land and with housing, is that uh, for him, uh, this is the major asset that people have, and everyone is seen as a potential entrepreneur. Uh, and that therefore you must give them the secure property rights in their house or their land with the idea that they can then realize that capital value as collateral or a loan or sell it uh, and so on. And so it is a kind of faith in the magic of the market even and and in a sense, what DeSoto did was to say, we must make these market transactions available, a little the way in which micro lending assumes, to the smallest entrepreneurs and give them, in a sense, access to the, their property as collateral uh, or to realize uh, its value in the market. Uh, I don't have any objection. It's, it's a project for the democratization of entrepreneurship, if you like. And, in the context of the neoliberal order, I suppose it's better than simply um, having uh, middle and upper classes monopolize uh, entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, on the other hand, it makes absolutely no concession to forms of common property, uh, to forms of uh, uh, joint management of commons, uh, and so on. And so it seems to me to be completely within the context of a neoliberal order. It just simply wants to democratize it. Your second question relates a little bit to, I'm not sure I'm directly responsive to your question, is more related to the work that I'm, that I'm doing now. Uh, the, I'm interested in the degree to which nation states 
are extending their control over the most inaccessible, difficult, out of the way places within their national boundaries. Uh, and you could say that 50 years ago, the government of Vietnam did not control much of the hills. The government of Burma still doesn't control much of it, its hills. The Thai government didn't control much of its hills or its mangrove swamps and so on. It turns out that mature capitalism absolutely needs the minerals, the rare metals for the electronics industry, the hydroelectric sites, and so on. It turns out that these places that were not interesting and not valuable, uh, and not, in a sense, in the French word, rentable, they were not profitable for the state to control. They didn't repay the cost of administration. These were areas that were governed indirectly under colonial rule. But these areas are, for the first time, since the 1960s and 70s under mature capitalism, extremely valuable because of the kinds of resources that they sit on. So tribal peoples everywhere are being moved out of the way for gold mines, iron mines, uh, aluminum mines, copper mines, uh, oil, hydroelectric sites, uh, and so on. And it seems to me that, in fact, the India and China who are the fastest growing world appetites for these industrial minerals uh, are in fact playing a larger role than the oil majors and the major Western companies. Canada is a big player in this too, of course, as a sort of a world mining power uh, as well. That in a sense, uh, under mature capitalism, the effort to extend government control over previously stateless peoples because they now sit on resources that have suddenly been believed, sudden, are suddenly understood to be extremely valuable. Uh, and uh, one, in order to control them, one needs to either move these people out of the way or uh, exert control over them. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I, I, I think I don't have anything intelligent to say that someone in the room wouldn't have something more intelligent to say. I know, as Clint Eastwood once said, a man has to know his limitations. <laughs>